gives us a good idea of what folliculitis, folliculitis, Phidias forum, whatever. I'm not gonna say it anymore, okay. <laughs> That's why it's called fungal acne. <laughs> Welcome back. We have a special surprise for you. This is a Derm Reacts video. It's a little bit different than our typical ones because, you know, we're in this situation. But today I have joining me Dr. Nina Desai. She is a board certified dermatologist in Manhattan Beach, California. And I'm so excited that we're making this work. Hello, Nina. Hi, how are you? I'm so excited to be here too. I know it's been you know, difficult not being able to be together, but I'm excited we're doing this. Me too, and if you guys don't know, we're like FaceTiming each other and then recording our own videos at the same time, it's really funny. Today's topic's a really important one because we have been getting asked questions about this all the time. It's fungal acne. This is probably something that I think over the past year especially has really come up as a big topic. People talk about it in our Facebook group, people talk about it, you know, when we get our videos that people want us to react to and stuff. And I thought that this was a really important topic to do with a dermatologist because fungal acne is a tricky one. I feel like I never used to hear about it and then suddenly in the past year it just became a big topic. So I wanted to hear what Nina has to say about it. So Nina, first off, tell us what is fungal acne? Okay, so fungal acne is neither an acne nor a fungus. So it's this kind of made up name for a condition that us dermatologists call malassezia or pterosporum folliculitis. It is a yeast buildup that occurs on the skin. So it's not a fungus, it's actually yeast. And it's a very different picture than a traditional acne picture. The triggers can be different and it can look different and the treatments can be different. Yeah, so when people say fungal acne, where do you think that they got this from? Is it because it kind of looks like acne? I think it can look like acne and oftentimes it's mistaken for acne. And sometimes people come to the dermatologist because they've tried to treat it like regular acne and it's just not getting better. And that's how they kind of present. They say, hey, I have this acne that's just not getting better with like the over-the-counter acne products. And it's called a fungus because the malassezia or the yeast is in the same biological classification as a yeast or fungus would be, but it's actually different. This is a yeast that probably just grows on our skin naturally? Yes, so the malassezia yeast does grow on our skin naturally. It can cause other conditions, a condition called seborrheic dermatitis or tinea versicolor. Those are other conditions that the malassezia yeast can actually cause and it overgrows on the skin in certain conditions to cause this, you know, fungal acne or pterosporum type picture. But does it show up the way acne does? Like if we see, do we see it like on the cheek area, on the forehead, all over the body? What, where do we see this? Typically, malassezia or pterosporum folliculitis is gonna occur in slightly different areas than traditional acne. Typically, you're gonna see it on the shoulders or the back or the chest. If we do see it on the face, oftentimes we kind of see it on the forehead or around around you know, the hairline where sweat tends to build up. So those are typically the areas where you're gonna see this type of pterosporum. So does it end up looking like acne in the sense of like, is it like little red bumps or does it tend to look more yeah. like clogged pores like whiteheads? It can look like little red bumps or clogged pores, but typically those clogged pores don't really come to a head like a real whitehead would. They tend to occur in crops more often, so you'll see little groups of them in the areas where you get them. And they tend to look deeper because the pterosporum actually affects the hair follicle. So whereas some acne you know, looks like you can squeeze it and you can get that white head out, the pterosporum folliculitis actually looks like more stuck or deeper under the skin because of the location where the yeast is. All right, so we're gonna take a look at a few pictures, but before we do, I just wanna let you guys know we're actually gonna tell you how to treat fungal acne Pidiosporum folliculitis, but we're gonna look at some pictures of what it could be first. We're showing you this so you have more information, but at the end of the day, you should definitely see a dermatologist. So, Dr. Desai, I want you to take a look at this one first. This is Celine. She has what I actually think a lot of people tend to think is fungal acne. What do you see with these pictures? So, when I look at Celine, I'm not really convinced that she's got pterosporum folliculitis at all because what I see is a lot of clogging around her mouth area. I see these whiteheads that are really to a head and that tends to be more typical of an acne type bacterial infection. So I actually think that she's in that category more so. The fact that it's really distributed around her chin and her jawline, she may have some component of hormonal acne. If you look at her skin, there is some old scarring and some old hyperpigmentation, which tells me that she may have had some cysts 
or some papules or pustules that are much more typical of an acne picture, whether it's hormonal or not. So I actually would ask her those questions and kind of talk to her about the cyclical nature of her acne and try to get a feel for if we think this might be hormonal acne as opposed to pterosporum folliculitis. We're saying from pictures, we're assuming it's not. Yeah, from these pictures, yeah. I would actually love to ask her what product she uses on her face, if she's using makeup brushes or sponges and how often she cleans them. A lot of the pustules that she has around her face oftentimes is typical of a little bacterial buildup on the face. So I'm really curious as to what she's putting on her face. All right, so next up we have Emily from our group and she thinks that she has some fungal acne happening on this side of her face. What do you think? So I don't think Emily has fungal acne either. So if you look at her face, what you're seeing is a mix of whiteheads and blackheads, which are very typical of regular acne, and you see this larger pustule. That pustule, again, it's very much to a head. That's very typical of a bacterial acne. I think she would do really well with something like a retinol or a Retin-A to help get out those blackheads and those whiteheads, and then something with a topical antibiotic component to it to calm down the pustular acne that she has. All right, so this next one is actually part of the body, which I think is gonna tell us a lot about what this is, just from what you've been telling us so far. What do you think about this picture? Yeah, so I do think that this picture is pretty clear for pterosporum folliculitis. If you notice, we're looking at the chest. That's a really common area where you get this yeast overgrowth because that tends to be an area where we really sweat and our sweat gets, you know, kind of stuck or occluded underneath our clothing. So this is a very typical picture. It's red, it's bumpy. You can tell that those areas look kind of deep. I would not be surprised if this patient tells you that she's itchy. So this is a really good example of pterosporum folliculitis. All right, so Dr. Desai, this one is very hard for me because I look at this and, and I'm really not sure because you also said that it can appear on the body mostly. So I'm looking at this and I'm kind of unsure of what this might be. Yeah, so this one is a tricky one and it is something that might actually be a mixed picture because what can happen with individuals who have all these tiny little bumps or these tiny little clogs she might have both a bacterial and a yeast buildup. So I have a couple more questions for her. I really wanna see what's going on on her chest, on her back. I'd wanna to talk to her about what products she's using. I'd wanna to talk to her about how much she sweats, things like that to kind of feel out what might be triggering this deep bumps for her. You can have a combination of problems happening then. You can, you can. It's not very typical, but some individuals can. I think sometimes we're so definitive about what we have yes. happening, but sometimes it's a combination of, of problems. Yeah, it can be. Not always, but it can be. And I think typically the acne component of it always gets better faster because people go out and they try the over-the-counter acne products and that component of it may get better, but the yeast component of it really doesn't go anywhere until you really diagnose that, okay, there's a yeast going on and we treat it with the appropriate medications. So this patient actually might have a mixed picture and after asking her those questions, and kind of seeing what she may have tried in the past, we can kind of get a better idea of if she has a mixed picture and how we should go about treating it. I've seen in our private Facebook group, people have been asking if ingredients like hyaluronic acid can cause fungal acne. So I'm wondering, you know, if you have any answers to something like that. Yeah, so there's no evidence to show that the ingredient itself, hyaluronic acid, or any other ingredients themselves can cause fungal acne. But what can happen is if someone's using a product that's kind of heavy or thick and occlusive in nature, and some products may have hyaluronic acid in it, or they may have heavier oils in it, or occlusive moisturizers, that can create an environment in which the yeast can grow because you're causing this clogging of the skin. So that can create an environment in which typical acne can grow too. So that's something to distinguish, whether it's from a product that you're using, not the product itself, but from the environment that the product is creating on your skin. So while some of these occlusive ingredients might be great for someone, they can also be terrible for someone Absolutely. else is essentially what you're saying, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. yes. And that's why history and getting a really detailed account of what someone's using is really important to their diagnosis. Yeah, and I would actually say hyaluronic acid isn't, that's not an occlusive ingredient. No, so it, Like it's you not. said, it's its really what mixture it is. Yes, exactly. It, what formula, right? Exactly, it's all about the formula. 
Here's another one that might be tricky, and I'm curious to see what it is that you're gonna say about this. Yeah, so when I look at her, I do see these deep bumps that may be reminiscent of a pterosporum folliculitis, but I also see some irritation and some redness and some scaling on her skin. So those all could be typical findings that you would find in a pterosporum or a yeast buildup, but I also kinda wanna know what she's using on her skin to make sure that some of her products aren't irritating her skin and actually contributing to this bumpy picture that she has. Because of that redness and that dryness and that scaling that I see, those are gonna be really important questions for her to figure out if she may not have a dermatitis actually going on. So you're saying it could be dermatitis potentially or it could be the pityosporum folliculitis. My bet's on dermatitis for her though, given the redness that I see. Oh, you're, you're thinking it's the dermatitis? I do, yeah. But this is why it's important to see a dermatologist. It is, it's really important. And I'd love to look at the rest of her too because Sometimes what's going on on one part of your body really helps you make the diagnosis about what's going on everywhere. This diagnosis gets missed all the time by people because they're not really thinking about a yeast buildup on their skin. They're thinking about a traditional acne that, you know, looks like these bumps on the skin. Sometimes the causes can be similar, you know, oil buildup or clogging of the skin can contribute to it. So they're really not thinking about the yeast buildup. So that's why so often an individual does not come in saying, hey, I think I have pterosporum folliculitis, but they'll come in saying, I have this acne and it just won't go away. That type of acne, you know, the pterosporum folliculitis tends to be a little bit more itchy, tends to be very resistant to, you know, over-the-counter topical acne treatments, but it's not really something that someone would be able to self-diagnose. So we've gotten a good idea of what it looks like and what it might not look like or what could kind of walk the line. So hearing you talk about this though, it makes me wonder, is this sort of like a yeast infection? Is that TMI to ask? Not at all, actually it really is. So the yeast is a little different than obviously a vaginal yeast infection that you would get, but what's happening is this yeast naturally lives on our skin and then in the wrong environment, it tends to overgrow. And one of the things that these two yeast infections do have in common is something like the use of an antibiotic. So when you take an antibiotic for you know, a bacterial infection, it changes the body's flora and it changes the yeast flora as well. So what's happening is the yeast then can proliferate or overgrow. Similar to the way individuals who take antibiotics for longer periods of time can develop that vaginal yeast infection. So there is a similarity between the two. So when you're getting your antibiotics and asking for the Diflucan, prescription you have to keep the you have to keep your skin in mind too yes absolutely you do you do everyone's sensitivities are different but it is a question that i ask when i see this in the office i've seen a few people ask the following questions also one if certain ethnicities tend to get this and also if the climate that you live in can affect whether yeah. you get it or not so ethnicities, no, not really, but climate, absolutely. So those that live in a very hot or humid climate are gonna be more susceptible to this. Those that you know are at the beach all the time, again, those are the individuals that are more susceptible to it. When you are sweating more, when it is hot, when it is more humid, that's the environment in which the yeast is going to overgrow. You know, I have a question since, you know, obviously it's called fungal acne or, you know, the, the nickname is fungal acne and it, the reason is because it tends to look like acne. Can you actually squeeze anything out the way you could with yeah. some acne? So these bumps do tend to appear deeper. You can, you know, if someone's aggressive, they can really get at them and you can get some of that oil clog out, some of that yeast build up out. I typically don't recommend doing that because it can be deeper and you can end up, you know, with some hyperpigmentation or scarring the skin. So I never recommend going after your own yeast build up or acne on your own. So then what would be the treatment for this? First line treatments, what you wanna do is you wanna pick something that has anti-yeast or antifungal properties to it. You can start with something super simple like an over-the-counter dandruff shampoo. Dandruff shampoos tend to be antifungal, whether you're looking at something like a Nizerol that has ketoconazole in it, if you're looking at some sort of Celsin Blue that has selenium sulfide in it, those tend to have the properties to kill this yeast. So what I typically recommend is using those dandruff shampoos as a wash. So the affected areas, you lather the shampoo on, you make a good nice lather and you leave it on for about five minutes before you rinse it off. And you do that, you don't have to do it every single time you wash, but I typically recommend doing it at least two to three times a week. And after you've cleared the pterosporin buildup, you wanna do it as like a maintenance too, to prevent the yeast from building up again. 
but sometimes the pterosporum is deep and it won't respond to the topical agents. So starting with that topical agent, using some kind of a dandruff shampoo like a Nizerol, you're gonna apply it just like you would your cleanser. And then after that, can you go into your normal skincare routine or what would you recommend? Yeah, so after you've washed it off, you definitely can use your normal skincare routine. Again, the things that you wanna look out for are products that may make that environment more pleasant for the yeast. So you wanna kinda avoid those thicker, heavier, greasier products something that doesn't, you know, kind of clog the pores. So avoid those products when you're treating the yeast buildup because you just don't want to kind of create that environment for it. But other than that, yes, you can use your normal skincare routine. Okay, so then you can use all of your actives and everything. You're just saying don't put on the heavier creams. Almost treat your skin like you Absolutely. might have an oily skin. Absolutely, yeah. Because some of the, you know, kind of actives are gonna help brighten the skin. They're gonna help, you know, cell turnover, things like that. If you're using your Retin-A or your Retinol, all of that is gonna help the skin. It's not gonna harm the fungal acne. It's not gonna treat it, but it's not gonna harm it. Will using one of these types of dandruff shampoos dry your skin out or harm it in any way? So you may feel a little bit more dry after using the dandruff shampoos. That can happen. But again, you want to hydrate the skin. And again, if you pick like an oil-free or a lighter moisturizer to hydrate with, then I think you'll be okay. I saw somebody say that they actually used an athlete's foot spray for this, which do you think that that's something that they can do as well? Same concept. Yes, the athlete, athlete's foot feet spray has an antifungal property to it. So that's what's actually killing the yeast. So actually the same concept. So oftentimes someone will grab like a clotrimazole or a terbinafine, which are the over-the-counter antifungal topicals that you can get. And that will work. It will work for some cases, for the milder cases, it will work. And then you said sometimes it can be a little resistant to using a shampoo like this or an antifungal spray. What yeah. would you then recommend? Yeah, so that can actually happen quite often. So after a couple of weeks of using either a topical antifungal cream or a dandruff shampoo, if this is really not improving, you do wanna see your dermatologist because the pterosporum folliculitis or the yeast can live in the hair follicle, so it can be deep. And in that case, what we wanna do is we wanna get you on an oral antifungal. Those really do work for the treatment of resistant pterosporum. All right, so I think we've covered a lot of this. Is there anything else that you think we should cover? The one thing I do want individuals who think they may be suffering with this to know is that there definitely is treatment for it. It can be really stubborn, it can be really resistant. That's why if you've tried over-the-counter acne products, if you've even tried over-the-counter, you know, anti-yeast products and you're still not getting anywhere, definitely go see your dermatologist because we treat this all the time, I treat this all the time. It does really respond to the correct treatment. So don't lose hope, we can absolutely treat it. This might even be easier to treat than typical acne then. Sometimes it is. The issue with this is that it does tend to recur. So that's some, an important thing to know as well. So while we can treat it, once you do get it, you are more susceptible to it recurring or coming back again, because as I said, this Malassezia yeast, it lives on the skin naturally. And when you know your body creates those environments for it to grow, it tends to happen again. So just know that this may be something that's going to require some maintenance. Once you see it again, you'll know, okay, it's cropping up again and we'll treat it again. So just know, you know, you might have to have some maintenance involved. All right, good to know. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Desai. I'm so glad we got to make this video work. We had so many videos scheduled and planned to shoot, so I'm glad that we're actually getting some of them done. Same, thank you so much, Susan, for having me on. It was just so much fun, and I'm so glad we got to do this. Me too. Thank you so much, you guys. Ask us questions in the comments below. Find us both on Instagram. I'll put our handles here on the screen, and we will talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.